Uh, and thank you for coming to our panel, which is titled School for Scandal, Measuring Student Learning. My name is Tom Lindsay, and I'm the director of the Center for Higher Education at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Our guests are going to approach the question of student learning from at least two, if not three, different perspectives. Now, there's a reason that uh, we chose the title School for Scandal, although we did put the qualifying question mark afterward. There are, there are some who regard the situation in higher education today as scandalous for the following reasons. On the one hand, we know from a number of studies that if you look at the amount of hours that students studied from the early 1960s to today, what you find is that the number of hours that students study alone has been cut nearly in half. Students used to study about 24 hours a week. In the early 60s, they now study about 14 hours a week. That leads to a second fact. Knowing the students study only half as much as they used to, you would think that that would lead students' grade point averages to go in which direction? You'd be wrong. In fact, in the last 50 years, while students are studying half as much as they did 50 years ago, their grades have gone up to the extent that while in the early 1960s only 15% of students received A's, today 43% of all grades given in college are A's. And, <laughs> and A is the most common grade given in college today. And then we have, just as disquieting if not more so, the results of the landmark national study published in 2011 titled Academically Adrift, Limited Learning on College Campuses. The authors of Academically Adrift tracked 2,300 college students from across the country from between 2005 and 2009. And, what they, and they administered to them the collegiate learning assessment which I would argue, and I know that at least one person on this panel will agree with me, is the, gold is the gold standard of measuring student learning. On the basis of these tests, it was found that 36% of today's college students, after four years in college, show little to no gain in fundamental academic skills critical thinking, complex reasoning, writing skills. I repeat, 36% showed little to no gain after four years in college. There are some who regard that as a scandal. To go further, as you all know, the, all, what is all the rage today is efforts across the country, not only in Texas, to increase student graduation rates, to have more students graduate and to have them graduate faster, and all for good reason, no one can be against higher graduation rates, all of the things being equal. We know that instead of graduating in four years, as used to be the norm, the average student today takes 5.3 years. We know that half the students who start college will never finish it. So graduating more students and graduating them faster will save students a lot of money. And we know that college has become prohibitively expensive, and this would be all to the good. The problem, though, in light of the results of Academically Adrift and its finding that we're failing 36% of our students, the problem is this. I mean, imagine this scenario. If a study came out tomorrow announcing that the American automotive industry produces cars that are dangerously defective in 36% of cases, and then the industry responded to this crisis by announcing a new initiative to build even more cars and to do it faster. If you have problems with that solution, then you probably have some concerns about the current focus on graduation rates and improving persistence. Having, all said, having said all that, that's the reason why there are some today who look at higher ed and regard the situation as nothing less than a scandal. And that's why we have our three esteemed speakers today who are going to address this. And I'll begin with a gentleman to my immediate right, Roger Benjamin, who is the president of the Council for Aid to Education. And just as a matter of truth in labeling here, the Council for Aid to Education also uh, puts out the collegiate learning assessment, which was the test used by Academically Adrift to uh, come to the conclusion that we're failing 36% of our students. To his immediate right is Dr. Julian Vasquez-Heilig of the University of Texas, Austin. And to his immediate right 
is Dr. Rob Coons, also of the University of Texas, Austin. We'll begin with Dr. Benjamin. Much, Tom. Um, I want to, uh, uh, you know, our CAE, for, uh, the Council of Rated Education, is a, uh, a nonprofit in uh, in New York, and uh, we're uh, a group that got together uh, in 1990, 18, 1998, 1999, and, and uh, at the time, uh, I was at Rand, a think tank on the West Coast, and we. Uh, decided to take a, a crack at, at, at trying to develop uh, useful assessments for post-secondary education. We had and have a lot <coughs> in uh, the high school space, but uh, for a number of reasons, we just haven't um, gone there uh, very much for standardized, appropriate standardized tests. And we came up with performance assessments, which have been around for a long time, but uh, Nobody had ever been, a been able to take them to scale because using, the, using pen and paper turned out to always be too costly, too error prone, and, and, and so on. Um, and uh, so that's what we do. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, and we're, uh, we co it also includes a board, uh, people like Benno Schmidt, the former Yale president, Dick Atkinson, the former University of California president, and businessmen from Johnson & Johnson and elsewhere that are interested in this subject. I want to start, though, for just, just a second to acknowledge the uh, death of James Buchanan, because I think it's salient to this discussion and certainly to this meeting. Uh, Jim uh, won a Nobel Prize. He co-founded the uh, Society for Public Choice. Um, and he's one of the people, not the only one, but uh, uh, his insight uh, had to do with uh, formulating or making formal uh, models that showed that incentives are really what drives uh, institutional and organizational change. Uh, and his work demonstrated that um, with size, with centralization, instead of getting economies of scale, which were or was the prevailing wisdom for a very long time, uh, you get uh, often diseconomies of scale, um, and uh, and that uh, that that notion, which turned out to be uh, uh, corroborated in a wide wide number of studies, has led to uh, institution after institution in the private and public sector moving away from governance by regulation and uh, uh, toward governance by the measurement of, of outcomes, uh, which after all, one would think one should be measuring to see how well the organization is meeting its intended targets. And then decentralization, uh, smaller is better often, particularly for information sensitive goods. And in the knowledge economy, of course, that's the world that we live in. Universities uh, are peculiar hybrids. They're both very centralized. Uh, but department-based governance uh, within silos is uh, is the way uh, they they operate. But I wanted to I wanted to just mention uh, Buchanan's focus on on, uh, on on incentives because people in my generation began to think about the role of assessment because if you in non-market institutions put a spotlight through assessment uh, of outcomes. Uh, the the uh, the uh, the quality of the product, and you get people to begin to regularly think about that uh, as they as they do in the health uh, field. Uh, it that itself is a is a good thing, and it's uh, it is I think safe to say today uh, it's beginning to lead to uh, some real progress. We are one 
of three or four national organizations in this space uh, uh, that I'm going to talk about. Here are the themes. Um, I, uh, I'm going to really try to follow on from the R.M. Ratsa study, uh, the academically adrift, which I think is, uh, is, is, is really quite, uh, I've got some interesting data for you. Um, and uh, first, what are we talking about? Well, the uh, products of, of the Educational Testing Service, the SAT people, uh, ACT, and then, and then the uh, CAE, uh, now have measures of these critical, these kinds of critical thinking skills. Uh, the notion is there's certainly nothing wrong with disciplines, but education is not only uh, about generating or going through and developing a particular major, uh, because undergraduate education is a joint product of, of many uh, fields, uh, and because in the knowledge economy, uh, the skills that I note here are really thought by employers, professors as well, um, as being critically important in an age in which you can Google for facts, we need to strengthen the next generation's ability to access structure and use information. Uh, that's, that's the concept. And indeed, these skills are independent. They're not just intelligence. They're not discipline-based, and there are not interaction effects between uh, uh, the measures uh, uh, as we uh, measure them. Uh, and disciplines, and I'm also then going to try to answer the question, are there practical uh, results from, from this approach which need to, be, uh, uh, need to be considered? These performance tasks, uh, these are some of, the, uh, some of the descriptors of them. Um, one way to put it, when you think about multiple choice tests, that's the world that we still live in. It's all about recognizing the right answer, recognize a painting. But in performance assessment, you have a realistic problem. A mayor's in a tough re-election campaign, and her, his appointed, or, uh, opponent says she's got the answer to the problem of crime, a drug reduction policy, et cetera. Uh, and then you have uh, 10, 12, 14 documents that are on quantitative and qualitative documents that the student can access online to go through, some of which are more or less relevant, and then write a reasoned essay. Uh, and indeed, they're designed around scientific uh, rubrics so that they are reliable and, va and, and valid. Um, and uh, it really, in its analogy of uh, the multiple choice test uh, approach, having one recognize a painting, you're actually asking the student to paint a different approach. Indeed, so I'm going to pivot from uh, the study that uh, Tom just mentioned. Uh, Richard and, and, and Giuseppe came to me, and I uh, uh, agreed to allow them uh, to participate and use this, this uh, study that, uh, uh, that we, we talked about here. And uh, Tom got, got the uh, statistics right. When you're just talking about the first two years, 45% of the students show no gains on the CLA, et cetera. And as Tom alluded, uh, what was interesting about their study wasn't just the CLA. They had a lot of other uh, corroborating uh, sets of data that showed uh, the same, the same uh, thing. I'm going to try to answer the question. This is, their study's been out just about a year. And so I thought, well, all right, we've got, we, we, we deliver the CLA. Again, ETS and ACT have got they, they can do some somewhat similar kinds of uh, activities. Um, let's take a look at a much bigger sample and try to build on what Aram and Rotska did. Uh, and here's what you get. In a sample of uh, over a thousand schools over seven years, um, if you look at uh, effect size, and that's simply a measure of, of the difference between two groups uh, over time, and you look uh, at all institutions, at least the, the CLA measures, you get a, 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 an effect size of 0.73 and a standard deviation of uh, 0.44 uh, for the four years. And, <clears throat> and it's, a, it's pretty much a bell-shaped curve, uh, which I'm going to make something of in just a, just a second. 
why is this important? Well, uh, uh, Richard was dealing with, with 25 schools. Um, this, is, this is a pretty, pretty broad sweep of the whole Carnegie classification. The next, uh, the next uh, curve uh, uses this value-added data. There, this, this is all about improvement. Uh, if you control for the SATs of the incoming freshmen um, and you look at the growth uh, in, in uh, cognitive learning as measured by these, these tests over the four years, um, how much better uh, do these students, how much growth does the, stu the institution add to the student over that four-year period? Um, what's the answer? Well, you see here, again, a bell-shaped curve. Uh, for these two years, um, and uh, and uh, uh, a standard deviation as as uh, developed here uh, is about uh, 0.98. Uh, uh, that's that's the mean, and you get uh, you get uh, this bell-shaped curve. All right, the mean, the major findings. Um, CLA scores do increase significantly over, over the course of college. I think we, we can say that. Um, but we can also say that uh, some colleges contribute much more than others. Um, so I think what these two together show is that you have a, a, a little bit more balanced picture of the collegiate student learning uh, landscape. Uh, they're really, there's, it, clearly, they're institutions that are in a very precarious state at the bottom, uh, not adding, and some even de seemingly, de they're just not adding much value to, to the students uh, uh, under them. But there are significant numbers of institutions with, with high growth. Uh, what's the bottom line on all of this? Well, at a minimum, uh, you've got uh, an opportunity to look at a portfolio study to, uh, aimed at understanding what causes the high growth schools uh, to succeed. And uh, since uh, academics uh, believe in intellectual honesty, uh, at a minimum you would think that this would be something one would uh, want to do. And then secondly, why not contribute uh, overall to trying systematically to move this, uh, move this curve up for the entire distribution. We have a new version of the CLA that's reliable and valid for individual students. That's just been released. The other one was focused on institutions. Uh, and that's exhibiting the same, uh, same uh, bell-shaped curve. Um, what does all this mean? I think that the uh, the, the new CLA Plus, as well as multiple choice tests that these other uh, organizations offer, uh, are going to be appropriate for competency-based approaches, certification results for graduating seniors, as Tom mentioned. Uh, you don't get much grade uh, different. A grade inflation means that most students don't have anything that shows uh, their actual skills in comparison to other students. Uh, and, of course, it's going to be used for accountability uh, et cetera. Assessment of, of, of student learning is going to increase significantly, I predict, uh, for the reasons that I note there. Uh, I think that uh, we're at the, at the beginning of a, of a tremendous surge in interest in this because of its importance. Thank you. So can you start my 10 minutes after I tell my three jokes and get my PowerPoint <laughs> slide up here? I'm going to probably need help too because I'm not, oh wait, here it is, here it is, here it is. See, I'm a digital native, so I should be able to do this, right? Great. So um, I'm Julian vasquez Heilig. I'm on faculty at uh, the University of Texas at Austin. <clears throat> hold a variety of roles. Some people say that my email signature is longer than the emails that I actually send. So I'd like to start with a, a question. Uh, how many of you are 100% happy with uh, No Child Left Behind? OK, now that we uh, have settled that. So what is the scandal here? Um, I think the scandal here, most of my work focuses on sort of the unintended consequences of high-stakes testing and accountability. Uh, 
But I think one of the biggest scandals is that as a society, we aren't measuring the outcomes that really matter to us as communities. How a child does on the Algebra II end of course, does that mean they're gonna do well at UT or not? Not necessarily, right? So I think we need a system, an outcome-based system, that is focused on the things that we care about as a society. So what I'm gonna do is try to keep you interested and talk about a brand new idea for accountability. I just came from a local control uh, uh, talk. And so this is what accountability looks like with local control. So Texas was one of the earlier states to develop testing systems in the 1980s. 1987, we required it for graduation. SB 7 uh, created the accountability system. Uh, it was first enacted in 1994. At the time, it was about district accreditation. From 1995 to 99, we ratcheted up the stakes and it became about school accountability and with social promotion, you could essentially see that as student accountability and with value-added models, you could see that as teacher accountability. So achievement gains uh, in Texas and these very low dropout rates were hailed as the Texas miracle. And this was the primary evidence that supported the transport of, of our uh, state policy to No Child Left Behind in DC. So while the theory of action intuitively seems possible, I'll give you a cookie if you do what's right and you're in trouble if you do what's wrong, um, then there was little scientifically based research uh, that was available to establish the e efficacy of whether accountability would actually work in practice. Um, uh, uh, Lieutenant Go former Lieutenant Governor Ratliff said they had a gut feeling about what accountability would do for the state and essentially the nation. So fast forward to 2013, did it work? So parents, educators, really the public at large wants to know has accountability accomplished what it said it would do with all its promise and fanfare. Well, as was talked about in the prior session and now we are not gonna be fully proficient by 2014. It didn't work. So in fact, the most recent statistical research has shown that the slope of improvement has actually been lower on the NAEP over the last decade than before accountability came into being. So essentially at the slope that we saw the last 10 years, it's gonna take us 80 more years to uh, close the achievement gap. Uh, is that fast enough for you? So faced with a gauntlet of high stakes testing, educational personnel, so why didn't it work? So one, this is part of the scandal, right? Faced with a, a gauntlet of high stakes testing, educational personnel made decisions about how to minimize the risk to their business, to their schools, which involved excluding low scoring students. You see this in Isleta in 1999. You see this in Houston in 2001. Remember Sharpstown had a 0% dropout rate? Uh, El Paso in 2012, the superintendent is gonna go to prison. Atlanta 2011, uh, and many, 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 many other cases. So high stakes testing has narrowed the curriculum as educators have been required to teach to the test and they have to spend their resources on teaching to the test. It was a discussion that was, uh, uh, went on in the other room. Not all people respond to accountability pressure in the same ways. I call this my brother-in-law effect. When he's faced with a challenge, he curls up into a ball and goes through his room. We're all in this room because we were successful in high stakes exams, that's the bottom line. But not everybody responds to high stakes pressure in the same ways. Documented persistent inequality in educational funding and teacher quality. Our teacher quality definition in the state is actually shameful. As long as you've had a certain number of hours and you're working towards your certification, you're considered a high quality teacher. Incessant focus on Band-Aid solutions. I know this one is, is controversial. But these solutions are just Band-Aid solutions. These are not structural solutions, charters, vouchers, high stakes exams. These are all Band-Aids. General bias in the curricular uh, and current educational policy that focuses on short-term goals. Accountability focuses on short-term goals. Snapshot measurements of outcomes that are cross-sectional. Teach for America, they're only there for two years. Defunding of pre-K, if there's a gold standard in the research literature is that pre-K makes a difference and saves society money, right? But because we have short-term budget constraints, we may, we've made tough decisions on that. So these are short-term perspectives. So the creators of accountability originally envisioned the policy as an information exchange. We're the only country in the world besides England that has a punitive system associated with accountability. Every other country, whether it's my school in Australia, the Middle East, all of their accountability systems are about getting information to the public. We are the only country that has this sort of sanction system. Uh, however, the punitive evolution of high stakes testing and accountability has fomented disillusionment amongst many former supporters of accountability. Any oper operationalization of student outcomes should foster a collective community goals. So what that means is, in fancy professor speak, is we need to be focused on what's important. 
So what was I thinking about? I, I went to an accountability conference in Rome. There's all these bright minds that are doing accountability, uh, state level folks, federal level folks, from all over the world talking about what they're doing. And so on the plane back, I thought to myself, how can we do this different? How can we do this better? How can we do this that communities are invested in this and the federal government, the state government, don't just come around uh, uh, with, with their ruler? So I consider that our data sets and their interconnectedness have advanced rapidly over the last two decades. The ERCs are an example of this. We can connect students, we can follow them into higher education, into the workforce, incarceration. We can do stuff that we could not do a decade ago. In the vein of Dewey, I consider the measurement of a child's success in conjunction with their heterogeneous pursuits. Um, we want all kids to go to college, but there are some kids that do want to be welders of their own free volition. In the political sphere, I ponder that Democrats often support community empowerment, Republicans espouse local control, which conflicts, it directly conflicts with the current complexion of No Child Left Behind. I thought about the history of school reform course that I had with David Tayek at Stanford a, de a decade ago that focused on community-based schooling. I also pondered how can we blend these ideas into a new form of accountability? So uh, what, is, what is the viable uh, alternative? A community empowered to be accountable to themselves and the nation. Educational policy where communities can democratically set the achievement goals that they desire. For some communities, maybe those goals are higher ACT and SAT scores, or a community may choose to focus on increasing the percentages of students enrolled and completing higher education, or even applying. Perhaps local priorities are lower rates of incarceration for their community, or career and workforce goals. In the current era, most states have reams of data that can be disaggregated and connected in many, many ways. Community-based accountability involves a process where superintendents, school boards, school staff, parents, students, business leaders, community stakeholders set short-term and long-term goals based on their priorities. Community-based accountability strategic plan statements developed at the community level would serve as alternatives to NCLB's intense focus on a top-down, one-size-fits-all policy. There is someone in this room that that one-size-fits-all t-shirt or hat will fit, but it's not me. It all empowers districts to focus on the outcomes that really matter beyond test scores, the thing that we as a society really care about. This new form of accountability will allow for communities to drive a locally-based approach that focuses on the process of education for their one-year, five-year, ten-year goals. It appeals across the political spectrum. The state and federal government role will be relegated to calculating the baselines for the set of perhaps 10 to 15 goals that communities set in a democratic process relative to the current levels of those particular outcomes. So you would be anchored in what you are doing right now and then set your goals. And we wouldn't have these pie in the sky goals like everyone's gonna be going to college in the next five years. We, you know, we could use standard deviations, we could do, use whatever we wanted, I mean those, those pieces, and we're gonna do an independent study this term and put together the language because we've talked with Corn and staff about this and they're interested. And then I'll talk about how the High Performance Coalition is actually, a, looks like that they wanna do something like this and, and I'll come to that in a minute. So community-based accountability may usher in a turn in community involvement in schools. In the US, our communities, our parents, our educators must see themselves as the solution, not the problem. So in conjunction with the aforementioned structural reforms that our nation continues to avoid, uh, this return to community-based schooling approach would foment a multiple measures approach to community education outcomes derived by the community and driven by the desire to see their children succeed, rather than a continuing focus on high-stakes exams and accountability policies that are persistently promoted. So I've discussed this with a lot of folks. Um, I've discussed it on my, on my website, Cloaking and Equity. I'd like to invite you to go there. Um, and uh, in person and with faculty, policymakers, practitioners. Um, in fact, I made this uh, pitch to Michael Williams, and he, you know, he was open to it, but he called it a cafeteria approach. And what I said was, is, well, everyone needs to eat a balanced diet. So what did the, the Dallas Morning News say uh, about the uh, High Performance Coalition, which was created in the 1557? So the consortium wants to be exempt from some federal and state testing requirements. They plan to move forward with what they call a community-based assessment and accountability system. On my blog, I said this made me giddy when I read that this was the direction that they were headed. The waivers are being sought by these 23 districts, which was created by the state in 2011 to develop new strategies. The consortium members say 10 waivers are needed to give them the flexibility to design an educational blueprint for the 21st century. Locally designed indicators can be more responsive to community needs while also uh, honoring established state standards. And what I mean by this is that you would have separate bins. So you might have bins for, for, for college. 
uh, and higher education goals. You might have, okay, you might have career uh, uh, goals. You might have some testing goals, and you, there could be some flexibility. Maybe you like the end of course, maybe you like the STAR, or maybe you like the ACT, or maybe you like the IO test of basic skills. But there will be flexibility in the communities to decide what are our, our priorities. And the state could require, well, you need to pick a certain number of measures from each of these bins. You need to have a testing bin, you need to have some higher education goals, you need to have some career goals. But the bottom line would be is that those goals would be, would be fomented by a process by which each community, all 1,200 districts, would go through. The consortium wants to replace, replace the STAR with the testing learning standards it's designed for the 21st century, so uh, uh, evolved test. The groups also want to eliminate double testing. Uh, they, they're looking at uh, random testing. They want flexibility to change graduation requirements, multiple paths to graduation, allowing students to pursue their passions rather than complying with rigid mandates. will help them discover interest for colleges and careers. So essentially what we're talking about here is instead of a top-down accountability policy, a locally based uh, policy that's based on data, Tests can be included, higher education goals are included, because those are the things that really matter to our society. Are our students ready for the uh, workforce? Are our students ready to compete at the University of Texas in history classes, in physics classes? Let's just be realistic. Do the, does the STAR tell us that? Do the end of course tell us that? We need to think about the long-term goals that our society has and change the process of school. So instead of spending money on remediating kids, making sure that they don't have bands and recess, that we're focusing on, are these kids ready to compete at UT? Are these kids ready to go into supply chain management? I think, those, I think a, a rethinking of what we're doing uh, using the technology and the data that we have will yield much better results. Thank you. So I am Rob Coons, and I do have um, 25 years of um, higher education experience teaching. I do want to mention, I should mention at the beginning that I'm speaking uh, just for myself, because um, I have some fairly radical ideas to throw out here, so I'm not speaking for my institution, certainly. <laughs> um, and what I want to talk about, uh, I'm going to narrow the focus a bit on, uh, on, on preparation for citizenship, civil, civic responsibility and focus in particular on, on history and American government. And I'll mention some, some results that we have in recent years. The uh, Intercollegiate Studies Institute Civic Literacy uh, uh, survey that was taken in 2006 to 2008. And then a very important new study uh, by the National, Ameri National Academy of, of, of Scholars that's just coming out today, actually. And uh, in a few minutes after this session's over, we're going to have a press conference in room 412, is that right? Uh, in which, uh, so at, right at 4.30, in which we unveil the, the study. So I'll, I don't want to step on uh, Dr. Fonte's uh, uh, presentation then, so I'll, but I will mention a couple of the main results from that study and its implications. And then I'll make a recommendation for how we can use accountability to improve the performance of, of higher education in this critical area. So first of all, Intercollegiate Studies Institute prepared a national uh, civic literacy survey in 2006 and 2007. And uh, they gave it to 28,000 uh, college freshmen and seniors from many different institutions, uh, 80 different uh, schools. And these were uh, questions about knowledge of American history and our political institutions. Uh, in both years, the average freshman and seniors also both failed the exam. Uh, we saw that in general, universities failed to improve or increase the knowledge of their students about American histories or institutions. A really trivial difference in, in terms of freshman versus senior learning. So getting back to this, uh, the CLA results as well. In fact, in many cases, it was negative. Uh, Duke, I think, was uh, famous for having showing a significant uh, negative result over four years. Uh, it was on average is 1.5% increase at UT, 1.2%. So pretty, or sorry, just over 2% at, at UT, so pretty insignificant increases. And overall, college seniors, as I said, failed the exam with an average score of 53.2, uh, 55.8 at UT, and then uh, uh, in the 40s at a number of other schools that they looked at. Uh, and i just to give a couple examples of what this involved. Uh, more than half could not identify the correct century in which uh, the first American colony was formed at uh, Jamestown. 55.4 uh, could not recognize Yorktown as the battle at which the American Revolution was won, and 28% thought it was Gettysburg at which uh, the uh, American Revolution was won. Uh, and fewer than half could recognize that the line, we hold these truths to be self-evident, came from the Declaration of Independence. So some pretty, uh, pretty bad results. Um, 
Uh, I don't know how many of you all know this, but the uh, wall of separation phrase, is, I'm sure you know, comes from the letter from Thomas Jefferson to Danbury uh, Baptist. Uh, very few students could recognize that. And um, more than half, uh, nearly half, did not know that the Federalist Papers uh, were written in support of the Constitution. That's uh, pretty bad. <laughs> Um, and uh, seniors actually scored lower than freshmen on this particular question. So there were a number of questions in which there was no improvement. In fact, there was negative results. Now, why does this matter? Uh, in 2000, 2008, ISI did a follow-up study in which they looked at the impact of knowledge of these kinds of basic facts about American history and institutions on civic engagement. And they measured civic engagement in a number of different ways, voting um, in, in primaries and general elections, contributing to candidates, running for office oneself, and so on. And they found that there's a that first of all, the college education as such has absolutely zero influence on civic engagement. So college educated people are not more likely to be civically engaged than, the, than, than those who did not graduate. But greater civic knowledge did positively correlate with greater civic engagement. In fact, it was the most robust result they could find of all the different factors they could look at to explain the differences in civic engagement was how much one knew about history and about institutions. So if we care about having citizens who are engaged, take their civic responsibilities seriously, then it's very important for us to educate them about these basic facts about our history. Now, as I say, there's a new study that's just coming out today from the National uh, uh, Association of Scholars called Recasting History. And it's the nation's first systematic audit of uh, core curriculum course content. Uh, we, uh, we examined over 600 reading assignments in 85 different courses in U.S. and Texas history at UT Austin and Texas A&M. We picked the two uh, top uh, uh, flagship universities, Research One universities. And this was made possible by a 2009 uh, Texas law that made all of the course syllabi and instructor CVs available online for all the uh, courses at uh, state universities. So as I say, the, uh, actually it's not this room, it's the next door, as it turns out. At 4.30 we'll have our national uh, result. So what we, uh, what we found was that, and this was not uh, really expected, but we found that a particular set of issues involving race, class, and gender had swollen to the point that it was crowding out all the other topics and uh, aspects of history in these courses. And so we think that this may be, th this failure to give a comprehensive uh, picture of the basic story of American history in the courses may explain why students are not, in fact, learning basic facts about history. It's not that they're being taught this but aren't picking it up, but this isn't being taught at all. So we looked at um, how, how heavily concentrated uh, courses are in these three very narrow topics. And so we labeled this high uh, courses in which over 50% of the reading assignments had themes from just those three topics, moderate uh, 25 to 50%. And what we found was that, um, I'll just focus on the left-hand side here, at uh, UT Austin, 78% of the instructors in these required American history courses were high assigners of these race, class, gender topics, more than 50% of the readings in the course. And at uh, a and a little better, but still 50%, which is pretty significant. Um, we also looked at those who had race, class, gender uh, research interests, sort of uh, separated that out. And there was a little difference at UT, but a somewhat significant difference at A&M, that those who had race, class, gender interests were somewhat more interested, more likely to be heavy assigners of it. And uh, again, this is just to give us a sense here of the way in which race, class, in this case, uh, topics are crowding out the other more traditional topics in history, economic, diplomatic, philosophical, and so on. These are, are quite small, and I think we would argue below a kind of critical mass at which students are getting a substantial body of knowledge about these things, whereas the racial class gender topics are swelling to cover more and more of, consume more and more of the time and energies of the students and the instructors in these courses. So we, we, we think that there's inadequate coverage in things like economic history, diplomatic history, philosophical, scientific uh, as well, in order to focus on social, cultural history, and especially within that area, these uh, sort of narrow topics. Just to illustrate this, at UT, there were six topics offered in this uh, semester uh, in which, six courses in which students could take, could satisfy three hours of this six hour American history requirement by taking a special topics course. And uh, here, here the, these are, this is the entire list of those six courses. And it gives a sense really of the way in which these narrow sort of topics are um, crowding out uh, other a more holistic, a more broad, uh, broader exposure to 
uh, to American history. So we think that's, uh, that's problematic. And we also find that over time, if you look at research interests, there's a kind of crowding out there as well. That uh, here we're looking at the generational difference. If you look at the difference between those who got their PhDs in the 70s and 80s versus those who got it in the 90s and, and, and after 2000. And this is these, again, self-described research interests based on the instructor's own CVs. We find that uh, there's a dramatic move towards the younger generation to be almost exclusively focused on these narrow topics to the exclusion of everything else. So the, the long-term trend line here is very disturbing, as well as the, the snapshot of that one semester. Uh, there's a book that also just came out this last year, which I recommend, uh, by Bruce Bauer, who's a, a journalist at, uh, in New York who has a PhD in, in English literature as well, uh, called The Victim's Revolution. And uh, this is much more anecdotal as opposed to the kind of quantitative study that, that uh, the NAS has done. But it reinforces the picture, really, which is that in these uh, subjects, history, humanities, uh, and, and uh, some of the social sciences, uh, that the, the focus is more and more on a fairly narrow set of topics, readings, and issues. Um, and so it's, uh, it's uh, I think, it's kind of disturbing. Why does this matter? Well, the legislature, legislature, when they passed the core curriculum law in 1971, which defined the 43-hour core right, and included six hours of American history, six hours of American government, clearly the intention in that law was to prepare Texas citizens for civic responsibilities. And we saw in the ISI study that civic responsibility, civic engagement, requires knowledge about American history. So where we're losing that broader knowledge, we think that we're, we're endangering that purpose that the Texas legislature had for these courses. Um, and I think, again, just, just wax philosophical here for a couple of minutes. Um, the very survival of a republic like ours depends upon a kind of collective memory, which is represented by, by history. It's our history that defines a common bond uh, for us as, as, as citizens as a people, our ideas, our long-term collaboration, our failures and our successes. And so the teaching of history is really a, a shared responsibility. It's not something that we can simply um, delegate to a small group of people in the universities. It's something that, that uh, we're, it's an area where transparency and accountability are really needed, where there should be a, a discussion, a conversation within the whole population about what we want these, uh, these core courses to cover. Um, so to fulfill, again, these functions, our historical knowledge has to be comprehensive and holistic, not too narrow. Too narrow focus on social history and to particular topics in, within that cuts us off from our political traditions, from our ideals. And the exclusive focus on victims and on a certain kind of um, political agenda, uh, in effect, silences and marginalizes people who are both conservatives and, and centrists, I think, in, both in the classroom and in the faculty lounge. So here's a, a specific proposal. Again, this is just something to throw out there to get the discussion going. Um, and I, I really appreciate Julian's uh, discussions here about the uh, no, no Child Left Behind, because um, I think that we can learn lessons from the failures of, of accountability and assessment in K through 12 and make sure that when we do this at the higher education level, we don't make the same mistakes. And, uh, and, and Julian actually touched on some of the points that I would like to emphasize uh, that we need to uh, make sure that we don't do on the higher education level. So first of all, since, since I, you know, the focus of my talk is on knowledge of American history, right? we could use something that we already know is reliable, that represents, represents a broad consensus within the scholarly community, which is the uh, AP US History exam. This is already used by all the universities in Texas for college credit. Right? So my proposal is just, just let's use that for an exit exam, right? But low stakes, not require any sort of score on this exam in order to graduate, merely to get information about how much student is learning. And then put the, put the scores on the transcript, but let, let, the, let the, those who are um, interacting with the student make their own judgment about how important these scores are. Uh, the AP exam measures the whole range of abilities. It doesn't just focus on the bottom and say, let's get over a minimum competency level. It'll distinguish between the incompetent and the competent student, but also distinguish between the Rhodes Scholar and the A student at the top. And so we're, we can reward value added right, uh, through this uh, by using uh, entrance exams as a kind of baseline. Right? So that uh, so institutions won't be motivated to exclude the weaker students right, because they're going to be assessed on value added, not on the absolute uh, score 
as a result of this. And then we could enforce this in various ways. As I say, we could uh, allow students, by empowering students, to satisfy these requirements by getting a good score on this exam without taking the course. So they could do online courses, they could use private tutoring, so long as they can get a course that's in the top 50 percentile, they would be qualified. And we could also, of course, put the, hold departments accountable if they're consistently failing to convey this knowledge. Um, finally, um, I, I, I would like to see this generalized to the whole core eventually, certainly to the American government courses, to social sciences, um, so that uh, we could get, so that the public could get real information about how successful colleges and universities are at performing their, their core, core functions. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Coons, and, and thank you, Dr. Benjamin, and thank you, Dr. Heilig. Please join me in thanking all three of our panelists for their presentations. Before we turn to your questions, I want to um, repeat uh, the invitation here. We are going to continue this discussion of student learning outcomes. In room 412, we'll, we'll, we'll be having a press conference announcing the National Association of Scholars, Texas Association of Scholars study recasting history. So that'll be in room 412 immediately at the conclusion of this panel. Um, and now we'll open things up for questions. Yes, sir. into something I think all three of you were talking about and adding one more. Accountability, using a little common sense, broad knowledge as compared to a narrow knowledge, and then I'll throw in a last one called debt getting out of college. I was watching an Occupy Wall Street demonstration a couple of years ago. They interviewed this girl and she had all these little you know, things stuck in her and you know how they looked. And she was complaining because she had a college degree and a master's degree and couldn't get a job. And the guy said to her, well, what did you major in? And she said, gay and lesbian studies. She was like fifty dollars or $60,000 in debt, had a master's degree in a subject that, if I could say gently, probably is not often used at General Electric, and she's complaining. Where I'm asking to you is, where do we get colleges to start to look at what is it we are offering? Because when we talk about no child left behind, that college left her behind and left her fifty dollars to $70,000 in debt. How do we get some kind of commonsensical review? It holds down college costs when you don't have degrees that are not applicable to the real world. At the same time, it gives kids something they can work from. Well, let me ask you this question. What do you think about calligraphy? Um, you could make a living with calligraphy. I have a friend who actually does it. <laughs> it's a living doing it. Well, this is, the, this is, I think this is the, the question. Well, this is, a, this is the question that I have is that, uh, you know, Steve Jobs, when he gave uh, the Stanford address, uh, he, he took um, a calligraphy class at Palo Alto College. And it's, and it's the reason why we have fonts today on our computers, right? And so I think part of the challenge is, is that liberal arts educations are, are very important to our society. We're, we're you know, and, and so, so there's that. I, but I, actually, I wanted to respond to, to this too, which is that, uh, you know, we just published an article in the Harvard Ed Review about the Texas Social Studies Standards. And so part of the thing was that with centralization comes power, right? And we know what happened with the Texas Social Studies Standards when seven people made most of the decisions for those standards. There was a lot of debate. And so I think part of the challenge is, and, and we did that with school finance too, right? We said we're going to centralize school finance. And now there's a lot of debate about, central, about that because we did that centralization of school finance because we expected to create more equality. But what we did was we actually created more inequality because we cut a lot of money from, from schools the last legislative session. So one of the things we have to think about is with centralization comes power and who defines that power? Who defines that history, right? And so part of the challenge I think is that, you know, I was a history major at the University of Michigan, right? And the thing is that, and I'll be straightforward with you. There was very little conversations about race and ethnicity in my high school history classes, like zero, like none. And I didn't get any of that until I actually got to college. So I had no idea about the histories of the civil rights. Most of that stuff is just touched on. And if you look at the Texas Social Studies Standards, there's very little of that in there too. So I, I just think we, we have to take these things on balance because there are people that believe that there's too much race and ethnicity, but there's also people that believe there's too little. So I, I think that I think that we, we, we just have to keep that on balance, and that uh, um, and then there was a third point that I was going to make, which was about um, 
about the debt, which is that you know, three generations, of, well, I guess it's really two generations of my family have attended the University of Michigan. When my parents went to the University of Michigan, it cost them about $2,000, and that was in the early 70s. When I went to the University of Michigan, it cost me $7,000, right? When my sister went to the University of Michigan, guess what? She graduated with $70,000 in debt. Because during that intervening period, the state of Michigan went from spending 60% 60, 60 of the budget at the university to 8%. Right? And those costs got passed on to the kids because we as a society couldn't support the university's funding stream like we had for many, many years. And so I think that's one of the things we have to consider is that some of that cost, whether it's gay and lesbian studies, my sister majored in nursing, which is a very valuable profession, but she had to move back home to live with her parents because even though she's making a lot of money, she has $70,000 in debt because we're more in a user-based society in terms of what, college costs, what colleges are gonna cost. Well, just this, this is a short re response. Uh, Richard Aram, with a group at the Social Science Research Council, has now recently done a follow-up study taking a look at uh, uh, the, the uh, level of employment uh, of students in this same CLA study five years after graduation. And uh, students uh, that uh, scored in the highest uh, percentile, the top 20 percent uh, have 3 uh, percent unemployment, and those that scored in the lowest have 12 percent. And that's important because, to me, evidence-based decision-making is a key part of this, uh, of an answer. It's not, it's not everything, but it's important information both for individual students and the institutions. Yeah. yeah. Going, I know. Why is that girl 50 to 70 grand in debt? It probably wasn't because of a professor. I know. It yeah, it's, it's a huge increase in cost. Political agenda. Yeah. The kid being a Michigan alum, I want to tell you, political agenda in Ann Arbor, you and I both know where you have. Yeah. Those cost increases yeah, yeah. are unbelievable. Yeah, right. see, in fact, it's my old university. The University of Minnesota was the Wall Street Journal case. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, the thing that's misleading, actually, I think really about, about Julian's uh, percentage of, of support going down is that, it, of course, the state support will go down if the costs are going up faster than the state support is going up. And that's exactly what's happened. So the cost of higher education has climbed so fast, so much faster than inflation, that even though in Texas the, the level of support has gone up some over time, the percentage is going down, right? Um, that's because we're not controlling our costs properly. And I think that... It, to sort of reinforce this point, what we need to go, really, ultimately, is from this sort of 19th century, how many hours in class did you spend model, to a 21st century, what skills and competencies have you gained? And, and then allow students to gain those skills and companies in a variety of ways, including more efficient ways than they're, they're currently achieving. I think that's ultimately what's going to happen, right? Uh, and, and to my mind, we need to get a, a those of us in the institutions should get and get ahead of that curve. Now, I actually very much believe in liberal education. I mean, I'm a philosophy professor. And, and philosophers actually do pretty well in terms of the job market over in the long haul because I think we're pretty good at getting these critical thinking skills across. So, um, so I, I would welcome this kind of evaluation. I think it'll, it'll actually be good for philosophy. <laughs> Students will, will flock to us because we'll learn, they'll learn these kinds of uh, thinking skills. Let me just add a couple of points to that. We hear a lot of this, and we really need to, especially at this time, to have clarity on this debate. You know, we hear, we, we hear both sides, one side saying university costs are out of control, the other side saying, well, tuitions have gone up because state funding has gone down. They're both right, but when you look at the details, a strong picture emerges, and that's this. There has been a mild decline in state funding, but that has been accompanied by a wild increase. Let me put numbers to that here in our home state of Texas. From 2000 to 2010, State funding for higher ed institute for public higher ed institution in Texas declined 17.4 percent in inflation-adjusted dollars from 2000 to 2010, but during that same period, tuition increased 84 percent. And that so we re, we need to have real clarity on this because otherwise we just keep on talking past each other and blaming uh, each other. Um, now. Another thing that needs, we need to disabuse ourselves of this notion you'll hear, and I as a former faculty member am sensitive to this, that faculty are getting fat on all of this money that's going to universities. It's not the case. 
Benjamin Ginsburg wrote a book in 2011 called The Fall of the Faculty, colon, The Rise of the All-Administrative University and Why It Matters. And what he shows is that 50 years ago, faculty outnumbered administrators. Today, faculty are the minority. And so the growth has been at the administrative level. And I mean, that's really where we have to go. And so when we talk about the need to increase education quality, a common response is, well, we're going to need more money to do that. Well, that may be the case, but it doesn't mean that we have to raise the Texas taxpayers, uh, uh, what Texas taxpayers pay. That money should be taken from administration, which has grown far too bloated over the last 50 years, and put where it belongs in teaching and learning, which is, after all, the central mission of our universities. Is there any level of education from K to 12 through graduate degree where administration is not dramatically no. increased more than teaching? No, there is not. There is not. That's right. That's right. It's come at the expense of faculty. It really has. Faculty have suffered from this. Faculty and the students have suffered from this. Yes, sir. So what would you do with you, uh, instead of giving uh, higher ed just a bulk amount of money uh, from the state, would you say this is going to uh, go into the academic realm of the classrooms? Uh, and, and so that, uh, and instead of giving you know, the money in bulk, say it's pinpointed to, to this one area? Well, I mean, as a former academic, both as a teacher and an administrator, I'm sensitive to the concerns on the part of universities that they don't want to be micromanaged. They don't want to have their academic freedom infringed upon. So at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, what we're forwarding at this upcoming legislative session to deal with these problems are efforts that aim to promote transparency in a couple of areas. For example, and this gets back to the, the earlier question, we, th we think that all, st we're putting forward a bill called the informed student document. And what it would do is it would make available to all students and their parents information on the amount of the average student loan debt that, that the, not only the university, but the major that they're thinking of enrolling in comes with, what the average starting salary is, what the uh, average graduation rate is, what, um, uh, what the persistence rate is, in other words, what we want to do is try to create a more knowledgeable consumer, right, who, can, who will then vote with his pocketbook and reward those universities and also those majors because, uh, and, 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 and Dr. Benjamin can speak to this uh, much more authoritatively than I can, but what we do know from academically adrift, it's not true that all majors are producing students who learn next to nothing after four years. We've identified the majors that are the worst, and we've identified the majors that do very well. Now, there's no, no one wants to stop if you, want to, if you want to enroll in one of those majors where you don't learn very much and where you also don't make very much money, you're free to do that. But what my hope is, what our hope at TPPF is, is that if students and their parents are more aware of that going in, they won't make mistakes, they won't 10 years later say, God, I wish I had known that before I spent X amount of money and got no job as a result. Well, I think the first thing is, again, transparency and uh, information. So, um, you know, I proposed, which is sort of an extreme position, right, a universal exit exam uh, using the AP uh, U.S. History exam, which, uh, you know, unlike the Social Security, Social Sciences standards, I mean, these have been developed uh, in a very non-political setting and are, are well accepted. Um, and, um, you know, and there are lots of things below that you could do. You could do, you could do a random sampling of students taking this exam to give some sort of sense of the value added. But, but the point is then make that information public. Put it on their websites. Give it to the legislators so that they know, okay, this is the result. This is how much value added in American history and government we're getting for our dollar. And I think that, you know, it will correct itself, really, once, that, once, you, get that, once you complete that information loop. Right? Once, uh, once you put attention to something, uh, the administrators and others, will, the faculty will start responding. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, and I'm John Hayes. I uh, happen to be a lawyer here, uh, but I'm also an ABD in American Studies. Uh, back in the day when William Getzman uh, was chairman and the department was very, very strong, 
Uh, so I believe in education. I also uh, teach as an adjunct professor at the UT Law School. That said, uh, aren't we really talking in some instances here about, for instance, and I absolutely believe that students need to learn the basics of American history and culture, but aren't we largely talking about things that really should be done in high school? And then further, uh, to mention a controversial name in some circles, Charles Murray, who argued that part of the problem is we have way too many kids in college that really shouldn't even be in college. And does that relate to perhaps we should also focus on building up and reinvigorating uh, trade schools and not selling the notion that everybody should go to college, including some, some of the brightest people I know actually never went to college and they've made a lot more money than I'll ever make. <laughs> yeah, I certainly agree with that last point. I think that's Maybe. absolutely right. That well, you know, I, 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 let me try to respond quickly to that, John. It's a good, I, I agree with the, both the premise and the direction you're heading. Uh, we need differentiation in this post-secondary education space really dramatically. To give you an idea of how vast the problem is, we've got over 16% of our uh, country's population that are high school dropouts. And right now, they're just, they're just cut loose. Uh, they don't make it through high school, and yet the, 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 the post-secondary se uh, sector as we know it doesn't feel any responsibility to do anything to impart basic skills, as you say, trade, the German, German apprentice uh, system, things like that. Uh, and if these people don't have some skills, they just don't have a shot at all. So it's bad for them, but it also really reduces the degrees of freedom for the entire society. So it's a huge, huge challenge. And I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, we've got, to be, we've, we've got to be thoughtful to both respond to them, but you know, they're not going to be taking courses in philosophy from, from Bob Coons, and they don't need to right now. Now, maybe that's, that's wrong. Right. <clears throat> One of the things that I thought was interesting and uh, Dr. Benjamin just said was that about 50% of our students don't complete high school. But if you were paying attention a few weeks ago, TEA told us that 85% of our students in our state are graduating, which is just not true. And so part of the thing I think that's really important is that the accountability system can also be used to tell you stories that just aren't true. Tall Texas tales. And so I, and, and it's not just the data on the dropout and the graduation, but they've been doing that on the tax and the toss and the star for years. They show you those upward slopes because they lower the cut scores as they go along. And so I think that the real measures of our success are things that are not within the purview of politics, such as the NAEP, the ACT, the SAT. Those are things that we should be paying attention to. I never pay attention to what the STAR says, what the tax says, because all of those things are politically controlled. Um, the other thing I think we need to think about is that we are, we are poo-pooing the colleges and universities in our nation, but they are the envy of the world. We have many, many, many international students that apply to our because we have the best universities in the world. Yes, University of Singapore, University of London, Cambridge, Oxford, there's a few. But the vast majority in the top 20 in the world belong to us. They belong to us. So even though maybe there's some people that talk about the efficiencies and the money being spent on administrative costs, but let me just tell you what those administrators do. They mean that I can focus on research and teaching because they fill out the paperwork for when I have to go to travel to conferences and these sorts of things. That's what those people do, and that allows us to focus on our students. Because if we're doing all this paperwork and these sorts of things, so just keep that in mind too, because this is another conversation, and I know I'm alone up here in the front, but this is another conversation that, that we've had about K-12, which is that our K-12 administrative costs are, are expensive, right? And so one of the things that, we, what, that I talk about is that I was a central administrator at Houston ISD. I was just talking about this before. And you know what I did as a central administrator? I was really expensive. I cost about $45,000 a year. I produced the tax report. I produced the accountability report. I did all the program evaluations for, this, for the district, right? And so central administrators, they actually do things, things that the, the, the public is demanding of our institutions, and a lot of them are related to accountability, student success, student outcomes. Those things are all related, and so those administrators actually have tasks. Are there places that we can slice a little fat here and there? Of course. But the bottom line, I think, for us is that, like, for example, UT Austin, we, the College of Education is ranked number three in the nation, right? We tied Harvard last year at number two. We're the highest ranked college in the entire state of Texas, the history of Texas, right? 
And so there are things that we are doing right in Texas. There's no doubt about that. So let's just keep that in context that our colleges and universities are the envy of the world. Uh, to add a little more context to that, um, I mean, two points. As a former administrator, I would, I would love to believe that the addition of administration has led teachers to be able to spend more time with their students. Alas, a study by the uh, Center for College Affordability and Productivity showed that at research institutions between 1988 and 2004, the amount of time that teachers spend with students declined 32 percent. This was at the same time that administration was going through the roof. Teachers are teaching less than they ever were before. And that, as the authors of Academically Adrift show, goes no small way toward explaining why 36% of our students managed to get through four years of college without learning anything. And yes, American universities remain the envy of the world, but let's again be, get down to the details here. There are about 150 universities in America that are the envy of the world, but there are 4,000 universities in the United States and when we look at the comparisons with other OECD nations, we are falling and have been falling compared to these nations in math and in science and in writing skills. So we can't afford to rest on our laurels. Can I just say one more thing? So there's, there's a question, which is, if you ask the legislature what they would like to see in an accountability system and students what they would like to see in an accountability system, you're going to see two totally different things. because. If, if the legislature says to me, because right now my classes are about 15, so if the legislature says to me, you need to have 30 PhD students in your class, that's good for the legislature, bad for the students, because the students want to be able to spend time with me and research with me, and when I have 30 students, it takes me a month to learn all of their names, where when I have 15 students, I can see every single one of those, I require them to come to my office hours. And so if we're going to think about accountability for education, because Corden and staff asked me about that this week too, which is, could we do this community-based accountability for our education, which is, if you want to design an accountability system, you want to think about this, keep the students in mind. Because if the students and the legislature are making the decisions, there's going to be different opinions on what that system should look like. I know that we're being, there are folks coming in here because our time has run out, but the good news is we can have higher education, we can increase higher education quality and do a better job teaching. We don't have to increase class size from 15 to 30, quite the contrary. If we simply get the 80% of faculty that studies show at UT, that the 80% of the faculty, they do not do research that contributes to maintaining their tier one status. If they simply were to go from teaching four classes a year to five classes a year, we could maintain that 15 to one ratio. We could, students could get more face-to-face -face contact. We could increase education quality and keep down costs at the same time. This is not a question of intellect. This is just a question of the will to do the right thing. We'll have to end it there.